welcome to the SBCA podcast, Component Connection. Hello, my name is Sean Shields, and today I'll be your host for this SBCA podcast series, focusing on entrepreneurs who helped shape the structural components industry and make it what it is today. My guests today are Richard Brown and Jim Finkenhofer. Together, they operated Trust Systems, a wood and cold form steel component manufacturing plant in Oxford, Georgia. After over 40 years in the industry, Richard retired in 2014 on his 70th birthday. Trust Systems operations were sold to 84 Lumber last year, and Jim is now the Vice President of Operations for two trust plants under the True House umbrella. Richard and Jim, thank you so much for joining us today. You're quite welcome. Glad to be here. Excellent. Well, let's start off by having you two share. Um, how did you guys meet? Uh, when was that? Where was it? That kind of thing. And, and ultimately, what prompted the two of you to decide to form a partnership in the trust industry? Jim, you want to have, have first crack at that or you want me to? Sure. Rich, Richard and I met when we were competitors in the, in the Atlanta area. He was running a trust plant uh, for Sanford and I was running Williams Brothers Trust Plant in downtown Atlanta. We met at a Georgia Components Manufacturer Association meeting back in 1986. We developed a friendship, and uh, even though we were competitors, we developed a friendship, and eventually um, Richard came and joined me at Williams Brothers, and um, we uh, at one point decided to sell, Williams Brothers decided to sell the plant, and Richard, went and purchased the assets of that plant and some of the business in 1990, April of 1990, and went off and started Trust Systems with uh, three other partners. And in late 1992, uh, he and his partners um, had decided to go in a different direction. And Richard and I, Richard contacted me, and I was working for Alpine at the time, and said, what would you think about us going into business together and you jumping in and buy a part of trust systems and we'll be partners. And we closed on January 4th, 1993 to become partners in trust systems. And uh, that partnership consisted of a handshake. We never right. ever had a formal partnership agreement and we never, either one of us violated that agreement other than with a handshake. And we ended up being in business together, either owning trust systems or real estate for what, 26 years, Richard? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. What I remember mainly about that, I made a note, a handwritten note to myself. The key thing that you said was we did it on a handshake. And to this day, uh, it's not many people that I meet that will do a partnership on a handshake. And that's what we did. We didn't have any formal written paperwork, but a partnership is like a marriage. And uh, I guess in a marriage you have legal documents too. But uh, we didn't have we didn't have any written paperwork. We had just a handshake, and to this day we've honored that. I, I think that's it's rare that you probably see that in today's society. Well, you guys obviously had a lot of trust in each other. Where where did that come from? Was it just interacting with each other? Um, to the Georgia chapter meetings, or was it the when you were at the company together? Where did it originate? I think initially it, it came from just meeting each other and, and knowing that we both had some of the same issues that we had to deal with. Uh, Jim managed the trust plant for Williams Brothers, and then I was managing a trust plant for uh, Sanford Company, and then I went to work for Alpine. Uh, Jim was my customer. And it was just a, you know, a, a building uh, relationship over years. And uh, we were competitors, but we were trustful competitors with each other. I mean, we, we trusted each other to do what was what we probably considered to be right. Uh, I can't say that for everybody that comes into the industry, but I think that we, we trusted each other as to, to uh, you know, treat our customers. And, and that's, that carried through into our, our relationship in, in our business. We dealt we dealt with our customers on that basis. We always had a respect for each other, always had a respect yeah, when, as we were competitors. And then, like I said, for a while, I was Richard's customer. And then <laughs> later after that, was, I went to work for Alpine when he started Trust Systems and he became my customer. 
Right. And there was always a mutual respect. I, I recognized what Richard brought to the table that I was lacking in, and I think he did the same. Uh, yep. We both relished each other's opinions and help in areas where we were maybe lacking. And uh, we just we just formed a very good partnership, and there was just a lot of respect for each other. And um, and that that handshake agreement was basically that if we don't agree on something, nothing happens. So we right. had to compromise. We were right. 50 50 partners, and we had to compromise in order to move forward on any project. Mm. Like I said, Sean, it's our partnership was like a marriage. You don't always see eye to eye with the person that you're married to, uh, but you you work through that. And, and and Jim and I had that same relationship. Uh, if we didn't if we didn't see eye to eye, we probably didn't uh, go forward with whatever we we're trying to do. I mean, we wanted to make sure that we were in agreement, and at that point in time, we we succeeded because of that. Well, do you have any specifics, anything that from those early years, as you know, we always talk about the honeymoon period and marriages. Did you have any struggles, challenges in those early years of figuring that out? Like, how were you going to go about coming to a place of compromise? Um, how did you overcome some of the, the differences that you did have? Well, we, ne we never saw 100% uh, of agreement and I probably was more stressed out than Jim probably really got. Uh, but but you work through that. And I think from that standpoint, I can't go back to anything, one specific thing, because over the years, we really didn't have a lot of uh, negative uh, agreement. Uh, we always were able to compromise. And, and Jim brought things to the table, like he said, that I, I was weak in. And, and hopefully I brought things to the table that, that he was somewhat weak in. Uh, and, and from that standpoint, we worked things out. Uh, I thought we had a good relationship uh, in our partnership. One of the things that we, I can tell you we did disagree on early on was getting into the light gauge or cold form steel side of trusses. Uh, that was something Richard, when he first started seeing it, was all excited about it. And I was not excited about it whatsoever. And it took him a year or two, but... Uh, you know, of, of constantly, um, you know, bringing it up and talking to me about it and working through it. But he never once, you know, became frustrated or there was never a heated moment. It was always why we should, why we should, you know, always trying to look for a different way of telling me why we should. And eventually we did and we became very successful. at it. So, you know, that was one example where there, there was some disagreement. I can tell you another one that was disagreement was when I went and joined him at Trust Systems. Um, they were doing about a million dollars a year in trust business, million and a half, something like that in sales. And and they were basically just wanting, he had, uh, was wanting to be about $100,000 a month in sales. And well, we were already hitting 200,000 after about six months and, and, and growing the business. And I wanted to start a second shift. And, uh, that was not in the cards for where, where Richard was thinking. And, and I said, well, then I'll do it myself. And I started working nights and running a second shift. And we had a second shift at, you know, once we, everybody saw the advantages of that, it continued. And we always had a second shift after that. Um, so we, we did, you know, we disagreed at times, but there was never, Richard, do you ever remember a crossword or, or where we were like, come on, you, you're being pig headed. Yeah. I, I don't ever remember that happening. And we both knew that we had to find a way to convince We're the different. other one. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. to see our point, you know, you had to just keep I, plugging away until you found a way to get the point across. Right. I, I think that we were able to communicate to each other, uh, you know, our feelings, our, our strengths, what we needed to get done uh, in order for the company to succeed. And the company was first and foremost. It wasn't Jim, it wasn't Richard. It was it was how, how can we how Good can we point. make the company succeed? Not for individuals. We were trying to make it uh and eventually <laughs> uh I, I guess at one time we, we were up around uh eleven, twelve million dollars in sales uh in, in the early years. Yeah, top year was we did we did fifteen million in two thousand and six. That's what we got up to. 
So I think one of the funniest things, and Jim always kind of reminds me of it, he says, Richard, when we first talked about getting into business together, was uh, Richard was, uh, after he did $100,000 a month, he was ready to go home. Uh, and what he meant by that, what I meant by that was that, you know, it wasn't, that I didn't mind working. It wasn't, that wasn't a case. It was just, I felt like that if we could do a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars a month in sales, that's all we would need to be successful. Well, I was wrong. <laughs> I mean, eventually we got up to over a million dollars a month, and uh, you know that's when we had to do that to stay successful. I thought we'd gotten successful, but we had to stay successful. We had to keep uh, helping our customers succeed, and that was that is the biggest issue. Is just because we were in business to helping our customers succeed. In addition to making trust systems succeed, you know, our customers were our focal point. We didn't have an outside sales force. And people say, what? But I mean, we did repetitive business from the same customers for a long time. Uh, And our customers weren't the big conglomerate like a Ryland Homes or uh, a company like that uh, nationwide. Our big customers were in Atlanta. They were Atlanta-based and uh, the area around here, around Atlanta, that's what we depended upon. Yep. All of our sales were word of mouth. You know, uh, one customer telling another customer about us and that they should give us a call. And we just kept building our business over the first uh, 13, 14 years that way. And those were the type of relationships that just like Richard and I had a relationship like that. Um, I think our customers saw that in us, and they were able to have the same kind of relationship with us. Like Richard said, we never employed a salesman. Yeah. Was that was that a conscious decision, or did it just sort of? I, I think it, that it was an involvement, you... Sean. I think it was. I think it evolved uh, when I first started the company in, in 1990. Uh, one of the agreements when I bought the equipment from uh, Williams Brothers was to be their supplier for trusses. And Williams Brothers, uh, and you'd have to go back to the early 90s, and, uh, but Williams Brothers really didn't want to be in the wood portion of their business. But their uh, their stores, uh, their uh, retail stores, uh, really needed somebody to provide trust. Well, we, we were that source. We had acquired the assets of the trust operation from Williams Brothers, we became their supplier, but that lasted only for about three or four years, and then they wanted to get back into business directly, which which they eventually did. Uh, but during that time, we were their supplier. Well, we took care of them up until the time they got back into business, and you know we were somewhat constricted during that time frame because we didn't want to step on their toes, and they consequently didn't want to step on our toes. But once we separated. Uh, then I think we moved forward and, and our customer base uh, understood that. And we actually competed against Williams Brothers uh, as the years wore on. And, and we took care of some of their customers. They took they took some of our customers over the years. But going back to the equation, we, we really, it was an involvement process. It wasn't, I don't, I don't think anything that on this date we did this and on this date we did that. It was, it was, evolve, it was an evolving uh, process. Yeah, Richard and I, you know, I'm sure many people have heard this saying, but there's there's three things you can sell someone. You can sell them quality, service, and price. Those are the three things you can sell, and and you should pick two, because if you're giving somebody all three, you're making a mistake. If you've got the best service and the best quality, you should not be out there with the best price. And if you have the best price, you better be shy on service or or quality or you're going to lose money and we our company philosophy was always quality and service we never wanted to be the lowest price in the marketplace ever in other words if we got somebody that called us and said hey we're awarding this to you you had the best price our comment was oh dang we messed up we screwed up we screwed Um, up somewhere (laughs) (laughs) we did we never wanted to hear you have the best price Right. And, and Jim's right. I mean, service and quality were our, our two prime ingredients that we provided our customer with. Why did you guys decide to focus on those two? Again, what I, what we just said was you can't, you can't be the cheapest guy in town. If you are, 
you're going to be out of business. Uh, it may not be next month. It may not be six months from now, but eventually you're going to be out of business. Uh, but service, you can give, you can give service, top rate service, every delivery that you ever make. You can give them the best quality that you can provide to them. And, and over the years, we learned from our suppliers, which was, was Alpine Engineered Products, but we also learned from the other companies in, in our industry what they concentrate on in, 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 in service and quality were the things that we always heard people talk about. Uh, that was one of the beauty of the Go ahead, Jim. I was just going to say, you can be a leader at, you know, in the industry. I mean, when I say a leader... Um, the marketplace is going to go the way of how the sub different suppliers of different industries perform. And if we were going to lead the market in a direction, we definitely wanted to be a leader in service and quality, not in price. Because every time you send out a low price, all you're going to do is require other people to follow that. So if you want your competition to follow your lead, you're much better off doing it with service and quality than you are with price. Um, Cause there's no point in being in business just to be in business. You can sit on your back porch and go broke. Uh, you don't have to work your tail off to do it. And that was the reason we, we, you know, we chose to go down that path and, and operate in the way we did. One of the things, and hopefully I brought this back to our company, uh, Jim and, and uh, we actually had a, a minor partner uh, in our company also, Larry Stuckey. But one of the things that primarily Jim and Larry, secondly, allowed me to do was be involved in, in WTCA. Uh, and, and I'd go to the meetings and I'd, and I'd bring more information back than what I ever took to the meetings, or at least I felt like that. I gained from, from that. And I, and, and I think Jim probably learned that over the years of, of his involvement with it, at SBCA. Uh, you, you gain a lot of information just by sitting there and being in the meetings and being involved in the associations. And that was, that was the beauty of what we had. And I know, as I say, I always came back and would tell Jim and, and Larry what things I'd heard about. That was my first real involvement with light gauge steel was going to the WTCA meetings and, and the people who were trying to get into uh, steel trust business, you know, they'd bring it and, and it was just a small group at that point in time. This was in back in the in the nineties, uh, late nineties and, and early two thousands. Our wood business was booming. We eventually got into the light gauge steel, which uh, you know was an evolving process. I mean, we we started off small, and eventually we took on a, on a an additional partner uh, that eventually brought us full bore into the steel business. And uh, so it, it's an evolving process, and I think. Uh, most of the companies over the years that, that we uh, really didn't compete with, but from around the diff different parts of the country, uh, I, I think that they would probably would agree agree with that same philosophy. It, they they learn to evolve into the light gauge steel business. Richard, you you raise a good point. Your company started, as you said, doing a hundred thousand dollars a month, and you eventually grew into a company that was doing a million dollars a month or over a million dollars a month. Yeah that didn't happen all gradually it didn't happen overnight didn't happen it, it didn't happen overnight i promise you no. that. It, it it happened over time uh, i mean again when i first started the company uh, i wanted to keep it small and, and where i thought i could control it <laughs> uh that's probably not the, not the fairest thing that i've said lately uh but uh we eventually uh our our business we managed our business best we could, but I think our business actually ran us. Uh, Jim and I did a good job of managing what we had, but uh, I think eventually uh, the business kind of took on a life of its own and it did well from that. Yeah, I mean, we, we never really intentionally kept trying to grow the business. The business kept coming to us. It's like I said, we had, we had a lot of customers who built in subdivisions where there might be two other builders. And eventually, the, our customer would convince the other guys in the subdivision that they should be using us as well. And once we got a customer, we rarely lost one. And good, it, good point, Jim. 
our customers caused us to grow. I mean, they just kept saying, we want more from you. We want more from you. Hey, can you handle this? Uh, can you take our business? Um, and we went, uh, sure, let's find a way. We'll get that done. And we just kept right. growing and growing that way. I think so. I think those are good points because eventually the company was successful. And I think people around the country saw us as, as a success. Uh, and not only around the country, I'm talking about primarily here in Georgia, of course, but uh, we succeeded because of, of what we did. We offered our customer two of the three things that Jim mentioned a while ago of service and quality. And you've got to do the best job so he will keep sending you business. And as I say, we didn't have a, an outside sales force. If anything, I was the outside salesperson. And believe me, you, you ain't got enough time to be everywhere if, if, you do, if you're doing a uh, million dollars, over a million dollars a month. You can't do it. I mean, it's, you got you got other things that's got to go on. Mm-hmm. So uh, you guys obviously successfully grew over the years. Did you have any failures? Anything that you decided you want to get into or something you wanted to try and ultimately just didn't prove to work very well in your market? Ooh. Good question. Um, I, I, I'm trying, trying to think, think of anything think of we did do. My head. <laughs> we ventured into a software to help us with our with our uh, job tracking and all that that didn't work out so well. But, you know, it was it was worth the gamble. We, we learned some stuff through it. Um, right. We bought a piece of equipment one time that was supposed to detect um, plates on the bottom and make sure you always had it. And that didn't work so well, but, uh, you know, we always were trying to run out there and try to do the latest and best thing. And, and you're not going to have the hits without having some failures. We bought, uh, some of the first auto sets from Alpine. We had all of our shop was auto sets from 1994 on. We bought the first computerized saws, a uh, Clary master, uh, computerized. We bought, you know, Alpine's first auto web saw, one of those. And we just kept buying the latest and greatest of the early computerized saws that, boy, they were, they were something. They, they cost a lot of money to keep running back then. <laughs> yeah, but they were worth it. it. You know, they, they, yeah. they were worth it. You know, they, they replaced people and real estate in your plant by having to have multiple saws. But boy, they were a challenge early on until all the equipment companies started getting them more perfected. But, you know, if you're not out there running around trying to get the latest and the best and, you know, you're going to have some failures. And, yeah, there were some things we bought that were like, yeah, not such a good idea. But, you know, major? No, I can't think of anything. Do you, Richard? No, I really can't. While you were talking about that, I thought of a story that uh, we'd gone to BCMC and I, this was back in, in the... Uh, I think it was around 2000. I, it might have been uh, before or after that. I can't remember. But we'd gone to a, uh, a BCMC show, and I believe that that year it was in Indianapolis. It may have been in Louisville, but we had bought a saw at the show from from Alpine, and they said that they had to take the saw back to Texas and put the other upgrades that they had uh, planned into into the saw, and they would ship it to us. Well. I get this call one Monday morning in, in uh, I think it was around the 1st of December, and uh, I get this call saying that we wouldn't be getting our saw because the truck had turned over and, and dumped the saw off the side of the interstate. And I thought somebody was pulling my leg. I mean, it was somebody from Alpine, but I thought they were pulling my leg. They weren't pulling my leg. That actually happened. Uh, the truck was carrying the saw to us had turned over. Fortunately, nobody got uh, seriously injured, but uh, destroyed the saw in the process, and we had to wait another three or four months for that they uh, uh, had promised to us and that we were expecting. To, and we had sold our other saw, one of our saws in, in the plant uh, previously, so we were shorthanded for three or four months uh, on on a saw. But you work through issues like that. Yeah, initially shock is there, but you work through them. And we talked back over the years that was kind of a something that we just had to deal with, and we worked through it. It wasn't that big of an issue, but at the time we thought it was. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you, um, we, we touched upon this uh, earlier. I wanted to ask you if you had a difficult year, like a year that you felt either set your back or was just really Mm -hmm. hard to navigate, but we sort of made the, the comment that there may have been more than one year. 
Yeah, we about? had a bad year from 2007 to 2012 or 13 was a bad year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, it was I, a bad I, year I, I, that, that kept on that, keeping on. When we started the company, uh, Sean, we had 13 employees. Uh, I was one of 13. Uh, in, ni- in 2007, we had 107 employees. Not necessarily all at one time, but primarily through that year. Well, in, in late 2007, we had to cut our workforce to 52. Hmm. That was difficult. I mean, to, to, to lay off people that, uh, in, in some respects, uh, uh, they had become, they go beyond employees. They become, uh, people that, you know, and respect and you see out on the street, they become, uh, almost like a family. And, uh, I, I know from 07, the next few years, uh, eventually we got in 2010, we got down to 26 employees. And we built it back over that next four years from 26 employees up to back up to uh, 55 or 56. And uh, at that point in time was when I retired and and sold the company. But those were difficult years to deal with. And, you know, that's that's about all I can say about it. I mean, you, you had to deal with the realities of what you were dealing with. Yeah, from our customer base in 2006, Every customer we had in 2006, by January of 2009, every one of them, other than one building supply, had closed their doors. Every customer had either gone bankrupt or shut down from 2006 until January of 2009, other than one building supply. Uh, Other than that, our customer base had to completely change. Yeah. And for a company that had grown not really having outside sales that must have been a significant challenge it was uh i mean you, you, significant you not, is you, one you, word you could use yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the one i would uh, choose but uh, yeah <laughs> but you have to deal with realities in your process and that's what we we had to work through uh, they were tough years and to keep the company going uh we had to do a lot of whittling and and uh it wasn't it wasn't fun doing the whittling it was uh not good at all and uh but we got through it and uh i think that from that standpoint you can say that we were successful on that end of it well certainly i mean there were a lot of component manufacturing uh businesses that went under during that time frame that you just mentioned and yet as you pointed out the two of you successfully navigated that making a lot of hard decisions. But you started out uh, by saying that you didn't make any decisions unless you guys could agree or at least could reach a compromise. I would imagine that that was even more difficult when you're cutting your uh, employee base in half, who are you going to cut and who are you going to keep? I would imagine that was a lot of sleepless nights that the two of you had trying to come to an agreement on that, right? You know, Sean, when you you say that, Richard, I was going to tell him that what Richard and I typically did on that, whether we were getting ready to pay bonuses, we always paid a bonus to everybody um, at 4th of July, and we always paid a year-end bonus based on our profitability. There was nothing that a point, any employees were promised, but as long as the company was profitable, we always took a share of that money and shared it back with the employees in bonuses. We also had a profit-sharing plan that they, they um, got money in. Once again, it was nothing they could contribute to, but... We put money into the plan and it was divided up based on, you know, the the rules of the plan. Uh, We would just stick a lump sum in. But it was kind of interesting. Every time Richard and I got ready to eat, whether it was, you know, deciding we had to cut people or paying bonuses or how much money we were going to put into the profit sharing plan. He and I always did that separately. And then we'd sit down in a room together and compare what we had written down. And it was amazing how often they matched to the penny or to the person. Yeah. He already knew how I thought. So rather than trying to just put our own thoughts, we always wrote down what we thought we were going to end up agreeing to. And that's pretty much what it would be when we went in the room and sat down together. That sounds like married couples could learn a lot from you guys. (laughs) (laughs) Again, I'm going to go back to what I said at the beginning of our talk today. 
Jim and I had a marriage. And in a marriage, you got good days and bad days. You got pluses and minuses. But at the end of the day, you got to come back together and come to come to the same conclusion because you can't go in two different directions. And Jim and I, I think from our friendship and our relationship over the years, that's what allowed us to be successful. Yeah, there were days when one of us didn't like the way things were going or, or a direction or something that had happened, and I would walk into Richard's office or he into mine, and there would be a bunch of venting that would start, you know, on, on the one side. And the other would just let the other one go until they were done and say, okay, are you done? Yeah, okay, now let's talk about it. Um, and you, you just got to let them get it out sometimes and and, <laughs> and not – not add to the problem or the argument. Just just let it get out there and then say, okay, what does that really mean and how do we move on from here? Hmm. You may have already answered this question through your your discussion today, but I want to ask it anyway, just in case there's anything you want to add. But when you look back at your careers in the trust business, what would you say you are most proud of thus far? I know, Jim, you're not quite done yet, so... You might change your answer by the end, but uh, I think that the one of the, one of the things I was involved from day one on the Georgia Component Manufacturers Association. Uh, they asked me to serve on a on a steering committee that uh, this was back in nineteen I guess it was nineteen seventy eight. We started the Georgia Component Manufacturers Association which is part of WTCA, and it was also part of the Southeast Trust Manufacturers. But one of the, the things I think that I helped bring the industry together in the uh, 80s and early 90s, and I'm proud of that involvement. I was a, directly a part of. I remember when Lee Volgaris and, and uh, Kirk came to me and, and said, would you come and serve on the board of WTCA? And this was uh, after we had gone through a really strenuous few years of, of the Southeast uh, trust manufacturers uh, didn't, for some reason, didn't trust the uh, National Association idea. And out of that, I think that I helped evolve the industry. And from that standpoint, that's probably my greatest achievement or accomplishment uh, in my mind. How about you? Jim? Mine would be the fact that how Richard and I ran our business, um, there was rarely, well, actually, I can't even think of one, somebody that we brought into the trust business, and meaning as a, as a uh, shop uh, supervisor or a designer or whoever, if, if we brought them into the industry and trained them and grew them, they stayed with us. Um, we had one designer that we hired who had experience elsewhere and came to us and we were looking we hired them and they didn't last long because what we learned was, you know, if they're going to leave their company, they're at for a few dollars, they'll leave you for a few dollars. But everybody we brought in, like Richard said, we treated them like family. I mean, everybody became a family there yeah. and we tried to take care of our employees the best we could to give them, you know, to make a good living, to learn a trade, and to be happy and, you know, feel good about what they'd learned and the job they did. And we always tried to support that with our employees. And um, I always felt like, you know, the majority of our employees, we even had a lot of shop guys that way. You know, people that worked in the shop right. for us for yeah. the entire length of time that, you know, uh, we had a lot of guys with 20 years experience. And that's one of the things I'm most proud of is that we created an atmosphere that people wanted to come there every day and they felt like they were learning something. They felt like they were earning a good way that they could take care of a family. And, yeah. you know, we always tried to provide the benefits and everything they needed to keep a secure workforce and something they could be proud of. Yeah. Good point. So I guess one last question, if you wanted to give some advice, some guidance to people who are just getting in the industry now, um, and you know, are looking to to stay in the industry, make careers of this. What guidance or or advice would you give them on how they should um, go about doing business? What they should do for self improvement? Um, how they should treat their customers, or how they should treat their their fellow employees? 
what would you say? Sean, I, I know Jim and I both started at the bottom. We didn't start at the top of the totem pole. Uh, Jim started in the trust industry in Iowa. I happen to start it in Georgia. Uh, but a lot of the same things that go on in Iowa also go on in Georgia. But you learn, and each day you try to improve upon what you did yesterday. And that's that's all we ever asked out of our employees was learn what you're doing. Understand the process that you've got to do. And, and if you do that, that will make you success. That will also make the company success. And, you know, if you go on that basis, I know from me personally, and I think from Jim's standpoint as well, as you grow in, in your knowledge of what you're doing, uh, as long as you keep applying that knowledge, you're going to help the company that you're working for. And over time, you may, I'm not saying you will, but you may get the opportunity to apply it for your own self. And that's what Jim and I both had the opportunity over the years. We applied and, and kept applying, and eventually we had the opportunity to own our own operation. And uh, Jim now works for a, a bigger company than we work for, uh, or our company. But I think that it is knowledge now going forward is it continues along that same line. Uh, some of us are old, like me. You know, we, we sit on the on the back deck of the house uh, watching the sun every day. So. Uh, from that standpoint, hopefully uh, you get the opportunity to do that down the road. Yeah, I would say um, for me, you know, is um, and I don't know who the philosopher was, but I read this quote years ago, and it said that the greatest knowledge you will ever gain is that knowledge that you gain after you finally realize you don't know it all. And basically that says to always keep an open mind because there is no way you know it all. Uh, and to never, don't ever think that you do, because there's a lot of folks out there that are smart and have good ideas. And if you just keep an open mind and listen, uh, there's a lot you can learn and you can always be improving. And, and, you know, SPCA is a great place for that. You know, I just recently filled out a poll online says, you know, what's the greatest thing you get from BCMC? For me, it's just, I go there to talk to people. Um, yeah. You know, i I can see the equipment at, at another trust plan. I can see things also, but to get all those folks in a room, it's why I attend. I mean, I just, I like to talk to other people and hear what they have to say and see what might click for me to improve at what I'm doing. Uh, Cause I'm still evolving. Uh, you know, I've been doing this since 1976 and I'm still evolving in the, in the trust industry. Yeah. Yep. I, I know when I, I know my trips to, to, to BCMC, Every, every year was just to, to hear what other people were doing and, 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 and listen to them. And, uh, you know, if you do that and you, and you have an open mind about the way things you will learn. I, I mean, it's, uh, in going to the meetings, I learned as much going to the meetings, uh, on a quarterly basis and then BCMC, there's so much knowledge out there. If you'll listen and then apply what, you don't have to apply every part. Only apply the parts that pertain to what you what you understand. You're going to be better off in the long run. Well, Richard, Jim, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been a great conversation. My pleasure, thank you, Sean. Thanks for inviting My us. My pleasure too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I'd also like to thank our listeners for spending this time with us. Hopefully, you've gained some insight from Jim and Richard on. Uh, how to run your business, and how to capitalize on today's market opportunities. Thank you for listening to SPCA's podcast, Component Connection. We are committed to bringing you a variety of information via this podcast. Please email your feedback or suggestions for future topics to podcast at sbcindustry.com. 